So ARM Cyberware got nicely expanded upon in Update 2.0 and Phantom Liberty. It is very much possible now to devise builds mainly based around each of these four items, and whilst this is a ranking video, not one of these items are definitively bad. It's just that some are more useful within their appropriate build, or just work better out of the box without the need for so much optimization. With that in mind, let's explore each of the four ARM Cyberwares, as well as when is best to use them and what you ought to group them with. Down at the bottom, we have the Mantis Blades. Now again, that is not to say that they're a bad item by any means, they have some really cool abilities, it's just that within certain blade builds, they're often beaten by a standard katana, and therefore there's less specific point to using them. Both weapons, of course, benefit from the same perk tree, that being blades, though the Mantises do have some much more brutal finishes. Don't get me wrong, they are badass to use in combat, and are arguably the most stylistic of the four arm cyberwares. In fact, whilst all models of arm cyberware come in four types, regular, thermal, electric, and toxic, the Mantis Blades actually have a secret fifth model, which can be acquired via two different methods. First way is by heading to the Jinguji clothing store in city center, speaking to Zane just once, then heading out and coming back two days later. This will trigger the bullet side quest, where the store gets assaulted by a cyber psycho whom you need to hold off until max tax show up. When they arrive, we'll meet Melissa Rory, the cyber psycho from the 2013 trailer who has since joined up with max tax. Speak to her afterwards, and we can ask about her blades, which were apparently discontinued in 2069 as they can potentially cause mental damage. Of course, we can demonstrate how deranged we already are by stepping out of the store and then attacking this entire max tax squad of not just the four regular members, but many, many more, as well as any other law enforcement that'll come from the immediate five-star wanted level. I'd argue, in fact, that it's the toughest fight in the entire game, though if you do manage to survive long enough to take down Rory, you can loot her max tack mantis blades. They've got a very sweet unique design, sure, but are statistically identical to the basic model. So worth getting? Yeah, sure, I mean they are a unique weapon after all, but if you're just going for them because of the blue design, then you may also prefer the electric model of standard mantis blades, which are a more glowing blue. Equally, there's a much easier way to get the max tack blades in Phantom Liberty, via one of the two ending paths. All you have to do is inform Mr. Hands of the coordinates to the max Stack convoy, and you'll afterwards receive them as a reward. Now, the biggest thing about the Mantis Blades is without a doubt the unique ability unlocked in the Relic skill tree, that being for charged attacks to allow you to leap towards targets from up to 30 meters away. Very, very useful for slightly more spread out combat encounters, not only letting you reach enemies quicker, but also take less damage as you move around the battlefield. Unlocking the Blade Finisher as well, you'll often be entering these small, badass looking quick time events, where again, you can't take any damage damage, and also regen a little bit of health after doing them. Now, the optimum build I found that this worked with involved specking into the central adrenaline rush tree from body, air dash and blades of course and reflexes, and then the edge runner tech tree for more cyberware. They pair okay with the berserk, but are best used with sand everston. For netrunners, it's kind of pointless going for anything other than the monowire, but we'll explore why later. To back up the mantis blades with cyberware then, you of course want to improve your overall melee damage. Dense marrow is great for this, but does increase stamina cost, though this can be mostly negated with the adrenaline booster from the circulatory system, rewarding an insane quarter of your stamina back every time you take out an enemy. Stabber is also good for improving crit chance, and cockatrice eyes if you can afford them, though personally I chose instead the absolutely goated Sandeviston rejuvenating axolotl, which I explored in the iconic cyberware video. Armor and damage is also crucial, given how up close and personal we're going to be for this, with chitin and proxy shields serving as some optimum pieces for this style of play. All in all, that'll give you a really decently powerful build, even for very hard. It's hyper agile and allows you to leap from enemy to enemy. The thing is though, and this is kind of what put Mantis Blades at the bottom, at least for me, is this perk. Flash and Thunderclap, which grants strong attacks with all blades the ability to leap towards targets. Yes, that means the unique ability of the Mantis Blades is no longer unique. Now, granted, I don't think the range with swords is quite as good, and with an extra relic point you can make Mantis Leap attacks cripple opponents too. But all of this is a bit null and void when we compare the two options in practice, and this same fight went so much smoother for me when using the Biako Katana rather than the Mantis Blades. The relevant perks and cyberware just synergize so much better with the Katana it seems, and turn you into some kind of fruit ninja pro, as opposed to some little stabby stab insect person. Now you could of course use the Mantis Blades in a 
less optimal build, say something with guns and just have them as a backup emergency melee weapon, which could make sense, yeah, but there I'd say Gorilla Arms are probably your better bet of the two, for reasons we'll come to. Again, Mantis Blades are not bad, they look awesome, they're just the least uniquely useful of the four on this list. So next up we have the projectile launcher, and this is certainly much more optimised than it was pre 2.0. Back then it was either underpowered trash, or with the track darts a literal click to incapacitate enemies one at a time button. Whereas now it's more of a rocket propelled superior alternative to grenades, at least when optimised. Though much like grenades, this thing operates within the equipment slots and can't be used endlessly, instead needing to recharge between uses. Therefore, unlike the other arm mods, the launcher can't per se be used by itself as a primary weapon. Though that's by no means a bad thing, and taking on the role of explosive support means it's a decent choice for the more generic, less specialised builds. Though Gorilla Arms still probably win overall in that battle, but we'll come to that. Whilst the projectile launcher can work well in any guns blazing ranged kind of build, here's what I found to be very optimal. Though granted you could definitely vary this, most importantly though we need to spec into both the equipment and cyberware nodes of the tech tree, since it will allow us to unlock the perk Doom Launcher. This massively buffs the projectile launch system with a ton of recharge boosts for essentially endless usage, especially in more intense enemy heavy combat scenarios. Additionally, with that you'll be wanting the Burn This City perk, which converts our stacks of Pyromania, an explosion damage increasing ability, into even more grenade or launcher charges, especially if we are getting caught in our own explosion radius too. Of course, with a build so chaotically explosive, the only way it's going to work in harder difficulties is to be backed up with a shit ton of firepower and damage negation. Edge Runner will help on the cyberware front, whereas for weapons I'd recommend specking into shotguns and LMGs, seeing as we're going to have to level body anyway for the health boosts. Also obliteration just sort of fits perfectly with this explosive kind of vibe. Of course you could also go with assault rifles, since we'll be specking reflexes anyway for the air dash, though that of course isn't going to be quite as tanky. Of course you'll also want the extra projectile charge from the relic skill tree and the ability to fire five shots at once, which is absolutely insane for this build. With cyberware, you mostly want to improve armor and damage mitigation, so things like neofiber, chitin, pain editor. Then if you are going heavy on guns, especially LMGs, a combination of immovable force and shock absorber will give you a huge reduction in recoil. Berserk would have been a great choice for this build pre 2.0, though now it's of course melee only, so not at all useful here. We haven't specced into intelligence at all, so cyberdeck is off the cards, and it's okay with Sand Everston, but your weapons are going to suffer from the time slow effect. So in fact, this is a fairly good build for which we can buy up the chrome compressor, exchanging your OS entirely for simply more cyberware to boost your attack and defense. All of this combined synergizes into this kind of not quite unkillable, but incredibly tanky and explosive build, which thrives in bigger fights especially. Just so long as you keep dark around firing bullets and shooting explosives from your arms, you'll get this endless feedback loop of regen provided you don't take too much damage at once. Build the Chimera Core into the Firecracker mod as well to make one of your guns fire explosive rounds and maybe a ready steady mod too to go with immovable force and reduce that recoil to practically zero. Only problem with LMGs is they do absolutely burn through ammo, which of course you can craft, but I still found myself going through all of it in bigger fights. Also note that whilst the five shot charge effect of projectile launcher is really great, you can't use items whilst firing those five explosives, but you can still take damage. So check your health bar before using that one, because you could very well wind up in a terrible and inescapable situation. Five direct hits from this thing though should be enough to take out even the skull level enemies, though annoyingly there are some foes that can deflect these explosives, such as the voodoo boy criminal activity boss Io Zarin, whom this build was fairly useless against. I mean great at taking down the rest of the base, I just really struggled against her because she could dodge all of my bullets and my explosives. Still the optimum build for the projectile launcher I'd say, very powerful, very tanky, but it does have its blind spots and might need tweaking for certain fights. Though of course let me know in the comments if you have a better, more optimum way to use the projectile launcher.
In second place, we have the Monowire. Though bear in mind, for any Netrunner heavy Cyberdeck sporting tubes, this is probably going to be the ultimate best arm cyberware for you. This thing has literally been designed to synergize with hacking and is really a core component to the Lucy kind of build now. Mind you, pure Netrunning can be so overpowered with just quick hacks now once you get to the later game that you may find yourself not needing this, and may instead want the Griller arms for reasons we'll come to next. Otherwise, Monowire users, you're going to find pretty much all your buffing perks within the hacking skill trees of intelligence, kind of randomly scattered about, same as the launcher is in tech. For instance, in the quick hack Q tree, we can unlock a monowire finisher, which looks awesome and restores health and RAM when used. Indeed, monowire now is heavily designed to synergize with Cyberdex and allow you to hack more by giving you more RAM. Basically, netrunners don't just have to be Heidi stealthy boys anymore that stay far away and hack through cameras. Don't get me wrong, that's still a viable and arguably more fun way to play, but tankier hacking builds which jump into the action with a monowire can indeed work, and very well come to that. I shamefully didn't touch on this enough in my Cyberdex ranking, I based them all too much on stealth capabilities there, and I absolutely intend to make up for that, with more comprehensive builds for each deck in other videos. But right here, right now, here's some tips to get the most out of the monowire in your build specifically. So whilst it's absolutely best used in a net running build, there is firstly a potential reason to use it outside of that, this being its relic skill tree ability for charged attacks to administer a control quick hack, which you can load onto the device beforehand. Basically, cripple movement, cyberware malfunction, reboot optics, or weapon glitch can be used on enemies even without a hacking build. This can be useful against groups if you have the data tunneling perk to spread the hack, but one of the best cases for this is cripple movement against bosses, holding them in place and making 1v1s a lot easier. It's something defo worth considering for a whole variety of builds. But as for netrunning and an optimum use of monowire, here's what I do. Spec mostly into intelligence and tech, 20 in each, then 15 reflexes for air dash and anything else into body for more health. Buy up edge runner and any other perks which will boost your cyberware specifically, then grab these basic body perks for some bonus health regen. This is going to be useful for overclocking. After that, sync whatever you can into the two quick hacking trees, ultimately aiming for the full four Q slots and spillover too. Bear in mind though, the the more perks you get from here, the less relevant monowire will technically become. In Frontal Cortex, we obviously want to boost RAM with stuff such as X-Disc, and then the expensive but awesome COX2 is going to enable your hacks to deal crit hits. Much more powerful for the ultimate hacking build, but again, going to render your wire less necessary. So possibly consider the RAM reallocator, depending on how you want to do this. After that, we're going to be getting up close a lot, so you want any boosts to health, armor, or damage mitigation, really. Shock and all is also a super useful defense mechanism for this. And then for the infinite overclock hacking loop, you're going to want to go with Biomonitor, Blood Pump, and Heal on Kill. Then the best cyberdex to use with the Monowire are either the Militech Paraline or Biotech Sigma, since both have specific buffs for the Monowire. The Sigma specifically works great with Contagion and Overheat, granting bonus wire damage to enemies affected by these hacks, whilst the Paraline can offer bonus wire damage, which scales with how much RAM you've used. Makes a lot of sense if you think about it, since that's when you need the monowire most. Other decks of course can work with this too, though won't be optimized as specifically for use with the monowire. Now, provided you have this selection of perks, hacking enemies will be insanely overpowered. Just queue four quick hacks onto every foe, with the later ones being a lot cheaper, thanks mostly to the Q mastery perk. This should, more often than not, take out most enemies by itself, with the monowire being our perfect cleanup tool for any stragglers. Not only tidying the battlefield, but also further boosting our RAM as it does. Again, with the Biotech Sigma, making one of the four hacks in that queue, Overheat or Contagion, will make our monowire even more effective. Whilst queuing Legendary Synapse Burnouts onto one enemy every five seconds is going to keep the effect of Overclock going indefinitely. Short Circuit and Cyberware Malfunction is also a decent combo, with the latter being very cheap, but also exceptionally damaging, and synergizing with Short Circuit. Overall, this build works brilliantly in most situations, though I definitely recommend staying out of wide open spaces, lose too much health at once, and overclock mode won't work properly. We won't have enough health to hack, and the entire perfectly balanced endless loop will crumble. Monowire does certainly help to keep all of this afloat in tighter situations though, and is the perfect support tool to one of the most powerful builds in the entire game. Just again, be very careful with it all, because with overclock you are going to be incredibly vulnerable and fragile most of the time, as you're sacrificing so much 
much health. In fact, I'm now kind of curious to see how the monowire would fare in our chrome compressor build. Is applying cripple movement to everyone gonna be more useful than endless explosions? Maybe I'll test that too somewhere, and possibly make a build video if it's any good. For now though, here's what I believe to be the most versatile, powerful, and all-round just useful arm mod in the game. Yep, some things never change. Griller Arms was my number one in 1.6, and it's my number one now. Granted, not always optimal in every situation, that's why I've given you builds for all the other ones too, but for anyone not devising a build purely based around arms who just wants a decent backup melee weapon say, then Griller Arms is a win for a couple of reasons. Firstly is the insanely useful ability to grant plus six to body checks at tier five, meaning you can open 20 body locked doors with just 14 body. So if you ever find a door that's just six body or less too high for you to open, you don't have to spec into the attributes where you otherwise wouldn't. All you've got to do is come back with these in order to get whatever's inside. They also make the boxing missions way, way easier since all the benefits and buffs carry through into those, what with these becoming your literal fists, and they have a cool relic ability too. Granted, Mantis Blades make you more nimble in combat, leaping towards enemies, though these do the opposite, blasting them away from you like some Iron Fist level shit. And when fully specced into in the relic tree even create a shockwave that knocks down anyone nearby. But these don't stop at just being the most useful to the more casual player. Oh no, Grilla Arms also fully benefit from the perks in the blunt weapon body tree, getting their own finisher, slamming the ground with quake, and blocking attacks for reduced damage, all the while occupying their own slots so you can sport three more weapons alongside, as though you need them. It sounds crazy, but you can fully get by using a powerful tank build and nothing but your fists. No other arm cyberware works better with Berserk, I'd say, but they're also a great pairing with Sandeviston too. The optimum build I used for these, which worked great, involved the health and blunt weapon trees from body, air dash as always from reflexes, the edge runner tree for tech, and then also some of the equipment perks to boost your heals. Cyberware is practically identical to the Mantis build that we used at the beginning, though of course I did switch out the stabber for Neo Fiber, since Griller Arms aren't a blade. I then tested both the Mantis Blades and Griller Arms Sandeviston builds in the same combat scenario on very hard, and found that whilst both were decent, Grilla just got the job done quicker and with a hell of a lot more obliteration. Possibly because blade perks are designed to buff attack speed, whereas blunt weapons buff stamina and health, which is ultimately more beneficial in the plummeting health pool Elden Punk mode that we call very hard. Though again, I'd say if you switched out the Mantis Blades for a Katana, then that would be on par with the Grilla Arms in terms of power level, so it fully depends on your playstyle. Again, I think it's the bonus body checks and eternal hand-to-hand -hand combat buffs which cement this one as the winner for me. Now one final thing I want to address here is the four different damage types. Basic, electric, thermal and toxic that you can get for each arm mod. Of course those actual damage types applied are worth considering but the way I ultimately decide which to get has more to do with attunements. Each type just so happens to attune with a different skill. So I just choose whichever one you have the highest attribute for to get the most extra damage. Damage. If multiple attributes are evenly distributed, then consider your cyberware. Do you have anything that's going to buff, say poison or fire? And finally, do any of these effects synergize with something else you're using? For example, applying burn to any foes affected by tier 4 plus contagion will cause them to explode, hinting towards you pairing a thermal monowire in a build that utilizes contagion. Anyway, that's the ranking, and hopefully it's useful to you when considering which arm mod to go for. Obviously, there's going to be other great ways to use them outside of my suggestions, so please comment below any others that you found to work really well. And hopefully together we can come up with some even more goated builds in 2.0. Huge thanks as always to the patrons for helping to keep the channel alive and free of annoying irrelevant sponsorships. You can find more about that in the description. Finally, thank you for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you soon in another video.